Chapter 21 Aran The door to Aran's cabin slid shut behind him. He glanced quickly around the room, every muscle in his body tense, then pulled the weapon off his belt and laid it on the cot. Ani squeezed out from the tiny space under his bed and made her way delicately over to him on the tips of her tentacles, her movements holding the furtive, diffident curiosity she exhibited when she could tell he was upset. He smiled despite himself and gestured to her, and she swarmed up his leg, around his back, and pulled herself onto her customary place on his shoulder, pressing her bulbous body against the side of his face. He sighed and reached up, tickling her gently under the chin, and her tentacles went a deep, satisfied green. "'Here's the thing, Ani,' he said, crossing over to the small drawers at the foot of his bed. "'Maybe the Chief Justice is right, and this whole trip was set up to fail, but that blood sample was real, and—' He shook his head. "'Ani, it's the best chance I've ever had, the only damn chance I've ever had. I'm not going to let Istve die. I won't. I don't honestly care about the damn consequences.' Ani stroked his arm soothingly with her tentacles, and he managed a small chuckle. She didn't have to understand what he was saying to know he was upset, and that was all that mattered to her. Ani, he could understand. Hell, he'd take being poisoned by tentacle spikes on accident any day over dealing with people, with their bewildering lies and jostling and positioning, for reasons he frankly couldn't comprehend no matter how much he tried. He knew, intellectually, that power and influence were considered objectively desirable. But he'd be damned if he understood why. Yes, he knew perfectly well what it felt to be so hungry you thought your stomach would eat itself from the inside out. And he knew what it felt like to be shivering and cold and have nowhere to go to get out of the rain and the wind, and no idea if you were going to stay warm enough overnight, or if, at some point, you'd shiver yourself to death, hypothermia slowly gripping your muscles and turning them sluggish, convincing your brain there was nothing to fear, that you were warm and comfortable, and you should sleep a sleep you'd never wake from. He could understand, trying to survive. But this? This? He'd never understand. The Chief Justice wants to turn back, he said, as Ani peered over his shoulder, with a decent approximation of someone hanging on his every word. I can't blame her. There's some plot to kill her, or sabotage the mission, or... Something along those lines. He pulled open the drawers and glanced through them. After years of field work, in conditions that tended to be too harsh even for drones, he'd learned how to pack light. Most of what he'd brought consisted of gear he'd scrounged, modified, or constructed over the years to suit his needs. Ugly, probably, and a bit unconventional, but effective. He sighed pulled open his battered rucksack and began shoving items into it in the practiced manner of long familiarity. It's my fault that they want to turn around. I was trying to find something that might help Istve, and I ended up screwing things up, he said quietly. But we're not going back, not the two of us. Not until we find whatever's behind that portal. Maybe whatever it is does shoot down ships, but something as small as an escape pod... I think we have at least an even chance of getting through unnoticed. He couldn't think too hard about what he was planning to do because terror would freeze his muscles and panic would turn his brain to mush. But he had experience planning expeditions that terrified the hell out of him. Hell, that was basically the story of every expedition he'd ever planned. Ani gave a sort of purr that he chose to take his agreement. We'll do what we promised, get the crew to refuse to go on, get everyone headed back safely. And then, just before the ship turns around, we'll slip into a pod and take off. I looked at the specs. It should work. He had looked at the escape pod specs, compulsively and in depth, over the course of their journey, during far too many nights, when the excitement of their daily research had faded and he was left with the lingering horror of the realization that they were hurtling through a vast, empty vacuum that would leave you a crystallized corpse choking on your own bodily fluids as you died. And right now, he was planning to voluntarily strap himself and Ani into something barely bigger than this cabin and take off into the center of that void. The pod had an oxygen generator and enough fuel cells and ration packs to hypothetically keep a person alive for a month or more. But he had no idea what was on the other side of the portal or how long it would take to reach it. 
For all he knew, the small, claustrophobic pod would become his coffin. He closed his eyes for a moment, steadying himself against the sudden wave of terror-induced nausea. It should be fine, he said. The pods are perfectly safe. He couldn't help the way his voice shook at the last words, but then there was no point in pretending to Ani that he wasn't abjectly terrified. It was his mood she picked up on, not his words, and she was attuned to the subtlest hints. There was nothing he could do to convince her he wasn't afraid. And in the end, it didn't actually matter. There was one thing, and one thing only, that scared him more than getting into that pod. And that was watching Istve die. Ani tightened her tentacles a little firmer around him and made a protective sort of clicking with her razor-sharp beak. He sank down on the cot for a moment, pulling her off his shoulders and into his lap, and stroked delicately down her long tentacles. She purred in pleasure, flattening her body slightly, her skin going an even deeper green. Aran chuckled. I'm sorry, Ani. I haven't been paying enough attention to you lately, have I? Well... Pretty soon it will be just you and me, and then you'll get all the attention you want. She grumbled a little, but it was half-hearted, and he could see her eyes closing to slits of contentment. There was a tap at the door, and Aran jerked his head up. Aran? Are you in there? He jumped to his feet, spilling Ani onto the floor. She growled in annoyance, grabbing at his leg to keep her balance. I'm... I'm here! I'm just... He began frantically bending to disentangle himself from Ani, and then the door slid open and Istve stepped inside. Aran straightened guiltily as Ani scrambled back to her perch on his shoulder, and Istve took in the disarray of the small cabin. For a long moment, neither of them said anything. Aran clenched his teeth, trying to think of some explanation, but when he saw Istve's face, he knew it was useless. They'd guessed what he was doing. They'd probably guessed before they'd come to tap on his door. He closed his eyes for a moment, bracing himself for Istve's furious lecture. When Istve spoke, though, their tone carried no anger at all, just a sort of sadness. Aran, they said quietly. He looked up, meeting their gaze, and, like always, those brown eyes seemed to pull him in until he felt like he was drowning. Istve, he mumbled, I... Istve shook their head. I can't talk you out of this, can I? They said, even if I tell you, it's probably going to kill you. Aran gritted his teeth. You're dying, Istve, he said, his voice harsh. We both know that. And if there's a chance, even the slightest, most ridiculous chance, I'm going to take it. You'd have to kill me to stop me. Istve managed a small smile, their expression one of mingled affection and misery. I know they said, even more quietly. I know there's nothing I can do. They reached out, and when Aran nodded, they put their hand on his arm. But you're not going alone. I'm coming with you. And before you say anything, I'm going to quote your own words back at you. You'd have to kill me to stop me. Aran stared at them for a moment. He opened his mouth to protest, then closed it again. Istve was right. Aran knew better than anyone how damn stubborn they could be, he wouldn't be able to force Istve to stay behind any more than he would Ani. So at last he nodded, with a rueful smile that matched his best friend's. Istve squeezed his arm gently. I checked the escape pods already, they said, since I was pretty sure you were going to come up with something ridiculous like this. We can take one of the four-person pods. It should give us a little extra life support in case it takes longer to get where we're going than we think, and it'll give Ani some extra room although I don't know that she'll need it, since she usually refuses to get more than a few centimeters distance from you, even if you're greeting a government minister in front of your hotel. They paused. And, um... They rummaged in their pocket and pulled out a small, wrapped package, holding it out. Butter taffy, your favorite. They had some in the kitchens, and I figured you'd be stressed, so... Aron stared at his friend for a moment speechless. Istve chuckled, and Aran was struck, suddenly, at how the sound made the cloying, nauseating, unassailable terror of what he was planning so much less debilitating. He smiled reluctantly and took the candy, shoving it into his mouth. The buttery sweetness spread across his tongue, 
and he closed his eyes and breathed in through his nose, the familiar homey taste grounding him. It only took him a few minutes to finish his packing. Istve waited for him, leaned back against the doorframe and reading through something on their palm screen. When Aran turned back to them, Istve glanced up, studying him for a moment. Then they leaned forward, fixing the collar of Aran's jacket in a familiar gesture. The back of their hand brushed Aran's throat, and for half a second he couldn't seem to pull in oxygen. Istve straightened, grinning. You ready to start a mutiny? they said. Aran drew in a shaky breath and smiled back despite himself. Ani had obviously picked up on the fact he was getting ready for a journey and didn't want to risk being left behind. And although he'd spent three years working with her, the fact of the matter was that if an inherently lethal killing machine like Ani, whose species had managed to keep an entire otherwise perfectly habitable planet from human colonization, who ate radiation like candy, and who seemed completely insusceptible to most modern forms of weaponry, decided that she was going somewhere. Well, she simply did. She spread across his back, tentacles gripping his shirt, blended herself in with the color of his clothing, and stubbornly ignored his pleas for her to wait in the cabin. He sighed. At least with her ability to camouflage, she wasn't as noticeable as she could have been, although she did end up leaving him looking distinctly lumpy in ways that it would be difficult to mistake as natural. Istve tucked their pistol inconspicuously in the back of their belt as they stepped into the corridor, and Aran shoved his pistol into his waist holster as well. True, Ani was the best protection either of them had, but there was no point in taking chances. The weight of it against his hip served as an ominous reminder that however dangerous this stupid mission had been before, it was a hell of a lot more dangerous now. Aran, said Gilda warmly, as he stepped into the lab. She went to put a hand on his shoulder, and he stepped back quickly. He didn't want Ani startled in this mood. She gave him a quick smile of apology. I saw you'd been down in the lab last night. Did you find anything interesting? I did, actually, he said. There must have been something in the tone of his voice, or else everyone had been craning their ears to overhear the conversation, because the lab went suddenly silent. Every face turned towards him. He walked over to the table and powered up the screen. This is probably something everyone should see, he said, pulling up the data from the night before. By the time he finished his explanation, the expressions around him ranged from faint skepticism to outright horror. I can't dispute your findings, said one of the scientists, an older man, his gravelly voice slow and cautious. But before we make any sweeping assumptions, we'd better be sure that the sample wasn't contaminated and that the results are replicable. Aran nodded. And even if they are, this isn't the only possible hypothesis. But I think it at least calls for a more in-depth analysis before we plunge ahead. Have you mentioned this to the captain? asked another of the scientists, a younger woman with thick black hair and a normally friendly smile, now turned into a frown of concern. He gave a short nod. He doesn't want to take the time to pursue this further. I think he's making a mistake. There was a murmuring among the assembled group. Maybe if he hears it from more than one of us, that will help, said the first man who'd spoken. My husband's one of the diplomatic aides, so I'll see if I can't get some of the diplomatic corps to bring up the matter as well. Aran shook his head in sudden panic. He'd seen the fear on Felia's face when he talked about the Corps having been infiltrated by the General's people, and he remembered all too well the tickle of spiny insect legs against the back of his neck. No, no, I don't think that's a good idea. The diplomatic corps probably won't be pleased with the idea of delaying the mission, and they might try to convince the captain of entirely the wrong thing. The man hesitated, then shrugged. You're the famous one. You'd know better than any of us what the bigwigs are like. If you think it's best, I do, said Aran fervently. There weren't many times that he was grateful for his unwanted notoriety, but if it kept this man's husband from winding up in a corridor with a slit throat, he'd take it. How many other people know? asked an older woman. He shook his head. Not many, you know, the captain knows. He'd never been good at lying, but this wasn't exactly a lie, so it flowed a little more easily over his tongue. She nodded, still watching him, and he turned away quickly, making a pretense of shutting down his screen. Anyway, he said, 
his eyes fixed on the table. It would be unbelievably helpful if you could convince the captain to turn around, or at least pause to give us time to look into this farther. I want to find a cure as much as anyone, but it won't do us much good if we're blown out of the sky the moment we pass through the portal. He took his time shutting down his equipment, and he could hear the scientists talking quietly, heading back to their desks, or more frequently, ducking out the door. At last, he and Istve and Ani were alone in the lab. I think you convinced them, Istve said quietly. We'll have to hope it's enough. They paused, glancing around at the deserted lab. I guess now we go talk to some of your friends in the crew. Aran nodded grimly. If he were being honest, the thought of walking out onto the crowded, noisy, bustling main deck set his teeth on edge and made his limbs heavy with dread. But Istve was right. They had a duty, at least, to keep as many people as possible alive. If that meant marching out onto the main deck and letting the crew swarm around him to congratulate him on his latest and likely much embellished exploit, well, he may not like it, but he'd do it. Istve smiled. It'll be fine, they said, a touch of affection in their tone. Get this done, and then you won't have to be around anyone but me and Ani for the next who knows how long. They chuckled, although by the end of it, you might get so tired of us that you wish you'd thrown us overboard in the first week. Aran gave a half-hearted chuckle, shaking his head, but it was slightly easier to force his legs to move him towards the door. They'd made it about halfway down the hallway when he caught, from the corner of his eye, the faintest movement, a shift in the pattern of light and shadow. Ani hissed, tightening her tentacles on his back, and he dropped to the ground on instinct as something hissed over his head. From behind him, he heard Istve's startled exclamation. Then they grunted in pain, and Aran, terror catching in his throat, rolled to his feet in time to see them stumble, barely catching themselves against the wall of the corridor. Istve, he shouted, grabbing for his friend. Istve's face had gone gray, sweat forming on their forehead. They opened their mouth as if to speak, specks of foam at the corners of their lips, and then their eyes rolled back into their head and their body went limp. Aran caught Istve as they fell and swore, his voice shaking. He lowered his friend gently to the deck, looking them over frantically for a sign of what had happened. It took him a moment to see it. A slender needle, like one you'd use to tranquilize an animal in the field, lodged in the fleshy part of Istve's upper arm. With another curse, Aran yanked off his jacket and tied a makeshift tourniquet at Istve's shoulder, cranking it tight. Better for Istve to lose an arm than lose their life to whatever the hell had been on the needle. The tourniquet done, he jerked the needle free, fingers fumbling for the kit at his belt. Ani, watch Istve, he snapped, and for once she obeyed, slithering off his arm and dropping to Istve's chest at the command. With her there, nothing would dare come close to Istve while he was gone, and if anyone did, they'd be dead before they had time to go for a weapon. He knew how fast Ani could move when she wanted to. He was already running back towards the lab as he plunged the needle into his test kit. It spat out a result as he shoved through the lab door and sprinted for the first aid cupboard, and he glanced down at it and swore again. Spiny wasp venom. Fast acting, and it would stop Istve's heart in less than a minute. He fumbled through the anti vials, knocking them over in his haste. He snatched out the correct one, then grabbed a long, thick needle and sprinted back towards where Istve lay. They were mostly still by now, face slack, spittle foaming at the corners of their mouth, the only movement the slight jerking of their limbs. Aran was still swearing under his breath, every curse word he knew and some he had to invent. He bent over Istve, feeling for a pulse. Nothing. He swallowed against the sick pit of dread welling in his stomach. It wasn't too late. He'd been fast, and Istve's heart couldn't have been stopped for more than a few seconds. Hands shaking almost too hard to manage, he fixed the needle to the small vial and felt carefully down Istve's ribcage. He closed his eyes, picturing where he'd have to place the needle to reach Istve's heart. Then he positioned his fingers gently as a marker, took a deep breath, and shoved the needle in with a sharp jerk of his hand. When he was sure it had reached its target, he depressed the back of the vial and watched it drain. Istve's chest gave a quick jerk under his hands, like a startled animal, then stilled. Arun swore again, 
yanking a small vial of artificial adrenaline from his pouch. Without removing the needle, he slipped the vial of antidote carefully off the end of it and replaced it with the adrenaline and depressed the back of the vial once more. This time, he felt Istve's heart jerk and stutter a couple more times like a frightened bird. He closed his eyes. Please, he whispered to whoever might be listening. Please. For a moment, Istve's heart seemed to still, and then it jerked again, then again, and then settled into a weak but rhythmic motion, the needle in Aran's fingers twitching at each beat. Aran let out a long breath, almost dizzy with relief, and with trembling fingers, yanked the needle from Istve's chest. Beneath the tourniquet, Istve's fingers were turning a dark purplish. Aran untied his jacket, massaging the blood gently back into Istve's hand. Their face was still slack, their eyes closed, their muscles limp under his fingers. He could feel the weak stutter of a pulse, and every beat he was terrified would be the last. "'I'm sorry, Pishti,' he muttered, fighting back the sharp sting of tears. "'I shouldn't have ducked. I should have been more careful. I should have damn well listened to you in the first place.' His voice choked. Without really thinking, he'd switched to the language he'd known as a child, the mountain dialect he'd only been able to speak when he was alone. "'You can't die on me, Pishti,' he whispered. "'I I don't know how to live without you. I don't know how to survive if you're not here. You always tease me about why I haven't found someone yet, but but damn it, Istve, it's because I love you. I've loved you since we were kids, and I've never been able to say it, because you don't want me to, and I don't know why. But I've never loved anyone but you, and if you die, it will destroy me.' He felt a faint movement under his hand, and he looked up, wiping his sleeve quickly across his face. Istve's eyes had blinked opened, and they were looking around in disoriented confusion. Aran! they croaked, their voice hoarse. The sudden rush of relief was almost enough to make Aran lightheaded. Istve! Istve! His voice choked again. What? What happened? they asked, voice still rough. You were poisoned! Aran's voice came out sharper than he'd meant. I was... They fell silent for a few moments. Then they frowned up at him. Just now, you were saying something. Aran felt the blood rush to his face and silently thanked any deity that might be listening that he'd been speaking mountain dialect. I was just saying I hoped you'd get better, because I don't want to go talk to the crew by myself. Istve's eyes had fallen closed again. But at his last words, they opened them again, fighting to raise their head. Aran, they muttered. I don't think we'd better talk to the crew. Their expression was grave. If someone was willing to kill you over what we found, because I'm certain it was you that poison was aimed for, they won't hesitate to kill anyone in the crew who speaks up. If we could find a way to tell them all at once, maybe, but now... They shook their head weakly. We'd just be deciding who to fix the target on next. Aran stared at them, his stomach nodding. We'll have to come up with a new plan, he said at last. He held out his arm for Ani, and she swarmed up it, returning to her usual perch. The pouches under her eyes were puffed up, and she made no attempt to blend into his shoulder this time, instead hissing like an angry cat. He helped Istve to their feet and the two of them walked slowly back towards their quarters, Istve leaning heavily on Aran, steps stumbling. Aran helped them onto their cot, then locked the door and shoved something against it to hold it shut. You should... you should go back, Istve began in an exhausted voice, but before they finished the sentence, their eyes had drifted shut, and they were asleep. Aran hesitated a moment, then pulled up the small chair from behind Istve's desk and sat, his pistol in his lap, although Ani, perched on his shoulder and puffed up like a beach ball still hissing angrily, would probably take care of any potential threat long before he had time to. He watched the slight rise and fall of Istve's chest as they lay on the bed, the exhausted droop of their eyelids, the unhealthy gray that lingered in the tips of their fingers and around their mouth and eyes. There was something cold and hard and furious inside him, now that the panic had died away. When it had been only him in danger, he could deal with that. He'd dealt with threats his entire life, and he wasn't afraid, or rather, he was terrified. But it had become such a familiar state 
that he'd learned how to push it to the back of his head. But this was different. Istve had almost died. Even the thought still closed up his throat with panic. He clenched his fists until the fingernails bit into the soft flesh of his palms, the pain of it steadying. They'd almost killed Istve. He couldn't let this happen, but he wasn't sure anymore that anything he could do would stop it. Chapter 22 Savina Provide your shipping code, please, said a businesslike voice over the ship's communication system. Savina raised her eyebrows at Joska, who sighed and leaned forward, tapping the line open. 57489. Ship's license, 87D. Registration, 55994872. We're running a short-term supplies and communications drop. There was a pause, and Savina found her heart beating a little faster. Benny had pushed through an information packet to the ship which should have showed the dolphin's route, but it listed Joska as the captain, probably better for all concerned not to have Savina's name showing up in the database. "'All right, you're clear to come aboard,' said the voice, sounding slightly mollified. Ahead of them, the bay doors slid open, revealing the gaping entrance to a massive loading dock. Joska glanced at Savina, and Savina could read the tension in the woman's posture, the obvious reluctance with which she was carrying out the orders. "'Listen, Savina,' she said quietly, her voice that wry, husky rasp that had become so familiar over the last few days. "'There has to be another way to—' Savina shook her head, pressing the muzzle of her gun a little harder into the back of Raphael's head. He winced and swore. "'Giving me new bruises isn't going to make your gun work any better,' he grumbled." Savina was tempted to turn the pistol and hit him across the head with it, but she refrained herself. She still needed these two, no point in antagonizing them more than necessary. She tried to ignore the small pang of guilt at the thought. It wasn't like it would stop her from doing what needed doing. Still, guilt wasn't a feeling she was accustomed to, and it unnerved her. Anyway, she couldn't afford to worry about it right now. Right now, the most important thing was keeping Nikolau alive, which meant killing the judge, everything else she could deal with later. Joska brought the ship in and set it down gently on the bay floor, and they waited until the outer airlock doors had sealed shut behind them, and the sensors on the inside of the ship flashed green. Savina removed the pistol from the back of Raphael's head and holstered it. Benny, make sure these two behave. I'm going to get us IDs and uniforms. I'll be back soon. Benny nodded, coming to take Savina's place. I've set the restraints and shut down the communications to outside the ship, they said. But there was a look on their face that said they were almost as unhappy about this as the captain was. Savina sighed. Benny was smart, and they were good at what they did, but they were far too trusting. They'd have been killed a hundred times over without Savina protecting them. And Savina planned to continue doing so, disapproval or no. She gave Joska and Raphael a friendly grin, straightened her sundress, and raked her fingers through her hair. Then she sauntered down the loading ramp, looking around her with the wide-eyed wonder of a planet-side girl on her first trip to space. "'Identify the securities officers,' she whispered into her wavelength. A moment later, a catalogue of translucent pictures popped up in the corner of her retinal screen. With a flick of her eye, she scrolled through them until she found a woman slightly older than herself, but of similar height and build. The name Maria Cortez flashed beneath the picture. "'Take me to her,' Savina said, and waited a moment while the device scanned. It beeped softly, a red, blinking light indicating the location of Savina's quarry, and she widened her smile and started off down the hallway. When she reached the woman's office, she tapped politely at the door. "'Yes?' called someone from within. "'I'm here to drop off some discs,' Savina called back. "'Reports from the officers on night watch, I think.' The door hissed open, and Savina stepped inside, peering around her with wide-eyed amazement. The woman at the desk smiled at her. First time on a ship like this?' she asked, a trace of kindness in her voice. Savina nodded, still staring around her. The woman stood. "'You get used to it soon enough.' although I'm not sure you'll ever set foot on a ship with a mission like this one has again, she added, a touch of wryness in her tone. I heard, said Savina, turning the full effect of her smile on the woman. I guess I'd better give you these then.
The woman returned her smile and held out her hand. Savina rummaged in her pocket, frowning as she stepped around the desk to stand beside the woman. They should be right. In a practiced movement, she pulled her other hand from under her sleeve, a long, needle-thin knife clasped between her fingers, and drove it through the woman's back, activating the electric shock at the moment she knew it touched the heart. The woman's eyes widened for a moment. Then she toppled forward on her desk. Savina counted to ten, then withdrew the weapon, the puncture wound so thin that only a few drops of blood welled and soaked into the woman's uniform. Good. Not having to clean the uniform would be a definite plus. Within a few minutes, she was dressed in the security officer's uniform. She checked her retinal screen, and when the hallway was empty, hoisted the limp body onto her shoulders with a grunt of effort and staggered down the hallway to the nearest airlock. With the woman's identification and passcode, it was easy enough to get the lock open, and she laid the body out on the floor. She stepped out of the airlock, closed the inner door, hit the outer door open, and counted to ten to give the body time to be sucked out. Then she closed it again, wiped her hands on her trousers, and, smiling cheerfully, stepped back into the deserted corridor. One uniform and identification down. Three more to go. By the time she got back to the ship with the stolen IDs and uniforms for Benny, Josca, and Raphael, she was whistling cheerfully, her good humor fully restored. It was nice to be doing something she was good at again. She walked briskly up the loading ramp and onto the Dolphin's flight deck. It felt a bit strange navigating the ship in full gravity after their time in space. When she entered, everyone was where she'd left them. "'I've got everything,' she said cheerfully, zipping open her bag and dumping its contents onto the floor. "'A uniform and ID for each of you.' Josca took the uniform reluctantly, her eyes hard. "'There's blood on the jacket,' she said quietly. Her eyes found Savina's, and there was an accusing look in them. Savina found she couldn't quite meet the captain's gaze. She shrugged easily. Nothing that won't come out with a bit of cold water. It shouldn't be noticeable anyway. But I do have some enzyme spray if you want to clean it up tonight. Josca didn't say anything, but there was a dark look in her eyes as she shrugged the jacket on. When they'd all dressed and Benny had set the IDs to their biometrics, Savina stood. She let her eyes linger for a moment on Josca, who was looking faintly mutinous, and Raphael, who was looking sullen. "'I'm here to kill the Chief Justice,' she said, her voice hard. "'The two of you may agree with me, or you may not. I don't care. But right now, you are wearing stolen uniforms, and you are carrying stolen IDs. If they find me, or Benny, or any single one of us, I can promise you that they won't listen to a word of your defenses.' You be locked in the brig, and I am very capable of making sure you die before you get home for them to hold trial. She gave a quick, mocking grin, glancing between Josca and Raphael. And if you aren't concerned for your own safety, please remember it's not just your own life at stake. If one of you speaks, both of you die. Josca's eyes were hard, with not fear, but a sort of disgust. Savina wouldn't have thought that would matter, but for some reason she found it hard to look the woman in the face. But the captain didn't say anything, just gave a curt nod. Raphael grumbled his assent as well, and Savina nodded, smiling. Excellent. The details of your roles should pull up on your wavelength screens as soon as you tap into your IDs. I tried to find people who were off duty tonight, since I figured we'd want some time to plan before we make our move, so shall we go? She beamed at them with her most infectious, innocent smile and gestured them out into the corridor ahead of her. Chapter 23. Alba. There was a grim silence in the small cabin as the door closed behind the young scientist. Aran had given his report with a brusque efficiency Alba had never seen in him before, his expression flinty, and the moment he'd finished answering their questions, he'd left to go back to where his friend was still sleeping. When Yosip had asked him, in some concern, if he was sure he'd be safe, he'd said, if anyone wants to try to get past Donnie, they're welcome to. And she'd had the sudden, uncomfortable recollection that this quiet young man was traveling with a creature that could probably wipe out a small city, if sufficiently provoked. He was on their side, nominally, but the idea was still not a comfortable one, almost a pity, really, that they couldn't use that destructive power against their unseen enemies— 
But the fact was, they still had very little idea who on the ship was a friend and who a foe, and an indiscriminate killing of the human population of the ship would hardly forward their goals. And she'd gathered enough to understand that releasing an irate Ani would be akin to releasing a wildfire in a dry forest, in both terms of the destruction it would cause and their ability to control it. Istvai was right, though, said Josip at last, his friendly face creased with concern. Any attempt to subvert the crew will just lead to deaths. We can't risk it. Aran's already told the scientists, and there's not much we can do about that. But I doubt the general would risk killing all the scientific corp, and honestly, if he does intend for Aran to die, he'll need most of the remaining scientists together to make up for Aran's rather unique skill set. So I suspect... I hope, at least, the general's people will find another way to keep them quiet. Alba nodded, trying to push back the cold that seemed to have settled permanently in the pit of her stomach. Either way, it's out of our hands at the moment. More important to focus on next options. She paused, chewing on her lip, a nervous gesture, and one she'd thought she'd left behind years ago. But something about being trapped on a ship with unknown enemies who clearly had no compunction about killing was, she found, bringing back more than one nervous habit she'd thought she'd overcome. She stopped herself with an effort and looked up. The obvious solution is to send out a general broadcast to the ship, but if there are as many of the general's people on board as we suspect there are, there is a high chance that the moment the broadcast is begun, whoever is transmitting the broadcast will die. I do not believe we're quite that desperate yet. She paused. I'm going to have to call Ander. We must work from the possibility that we will not be successful in getting the ship turned around before we reach the portal. I'm still hopeful that, since we have advance warning that Kavako's up to something, we may be able to somehow salvage the mission. It's possible, too, that our resident scientist is being overly paranoid, the fact that the aliens sent something through the portal with at least nominally peaceful intent leaves open the possibility that, in this case at least, they merely want to open a dialogue, but we can't rely on either of those possibilities. However, if the president is made aware of our situation, it may be that with this additional information he will be able to rally the public to our side. I imagine that no matter how popular Cavaco's made himself in my absence, with both myself and their folk hero scientist on board, the citizenry will be outraged at any suggestion of sabotage and doubly outraged at these murder attempts. If the ensuing furor doesn't force the general to rescind his orders to the captain and bring the ship back, at the very least it will mitigate the effectiveness of his overall strategy. I can't imagine he will realize any political benefit from his scheme once word gets out that he's intentionally sabotaged the diplomatic effort as well as attempted to murder Aran Rameau. Feliu nodded. I don't suppose we have a better option at the moment, he said reluctantly. It's not a solution, but perhaps it will buy us time to come up with one. She gave a brisk nod, turning to Josip. When is your friend on duty in the communications bay? Josip frowned, tapping his left temple to and muttering, Time? He nodded, a small smile tweaking the corners of his mouth, despite the overall grimness of his expression. She'll be coming on duty in half an hour or so. We'll give her half an hour to get settled, then I'll take you down. In the end, all four of them went. Felu refused to leave Alba alone with only Josip for protection, and Josip refused to leave Inez by herself. Inez's face had taken on a permanently stunned expression, but Alba could see her relief at not being left alone to be the next potential murder victim. So they made a larger group than Alba would have liked as they walked down the corridors towards the communications bay. It was probably simply the time of day, but the corridors felt ominously quiet, the ship's normal bustle conspicuously absent. She shook her head. She was seeing danger where there was none. At least, she was seeing signs of danger that were likely inaccurate, although... The danger itself was certainly real enough. Still, the long walk had taken on a sinister air. Every pair of eyes from a crew member or an officer brushing past them, every respectful nod to her, every quiet, friendly greeting to Josip, a veiled threat. When they reached the communications bay, Josip gestured them to stay back. 
I'll go talk to her, make sure that she can put me through. There are times they monitor the feed more closely, and I don't want to risk her safety. Alba nodded, and the three of them stood in a close huddle in the corner of the corridor as Yosip tapped on the door to the communications bay. A moment later, the door slid open, but the person standing there was not Adela. What do you need? the man asked in a bored tone. Yosip gave him that easy smile. Diogo, he said. What are you doing on duty? I thought Adela was on duty today. The man's face, which had relaxed at the friendly greeting, turned grim. Didn't you hear? He paused, his voice softening slightly. I'm sorry, Yosip. She's dead. Alba felt like a giant hand had taken hold of her chest and was squeezing. Dead? repeated Yosip softly. She couldn't see his face, but she could hear the strain and disbelief and genuine sorrow in his tone. The man nodded. I'm sorry to be the one to break the news. It happened three days ago. There must have been something in the rations she was allergic to. Anaphylactic shock, she was gone before anyone could get to her. He shook his head. We sent word back to her partner and their daughter. It's too bad her kid wasn't very old. Even through her sudden panic, Alba could see the weary slump of Yosip's posture. I'm sorry to hear that, he said, his voice heavy. My condolences. To you and to her family. Back on planet. The man nodded. Thank you, he paused. And to you. She spoke about you frequently. Yosip turned away as the doors slid shut behind him, and there was a weariness to his posture that hadn't been there before. Can you ask him to let us put a message through? Felia whispered urgently, but Yosip shook his head. No, he's not one who'd let protocol slide. Alba could hear in his voice that even if the man would have agreed, Yosip wouldn't have been able to bring himself to ask. It wasn't your fault, she found herself saying, as they walked silently back to her cabin. You had no idea this would happen. Even as she said the words, she could feel the discomfort in them, if it had been someone's fault, it was hers. She'd asked for the political message to be sent. She hadn't known at the time what the implications would be, but she'd certainly been best positioned to have guessed. Yosip turned to her with a small smile, but there was a sadness in his eyes that was far deeper than she would have expected. She had a daughter, he said quietly. Thirteen years old. The same age my grandson would have been if he'd lived. There was nothing to say to that. Alba nodded, and they finished the short trip in silence. Once the door had closed behind the four of them and Felu had locked it tightly, he sank down into a chair at Alba's small table. I don't know what else to do, he said, his voice hollow with despair. We're just over 24 planetary hours away from the portal. Once we pass through it, who knows if we'll be able to send word back at all. There, there might be one more thing we could try, said Inez, in her timid voice. We could sabotage the ship. Not the supplies, I mean, but the ship itself. They all turned to stare at her, and she shrunk under the weight of their combined gaze. Then Yosip smiled that gentle, friendly smile, his eyes regaining a touch of their usual twinkle. Inez, he said, you're brilliant. The girl looked up eagerly at his words, the hope in her face almost painful. I don't see how that... Felio began irritably, but Alba raised a hand. No, she said. I think the girl might have a point. I'd like to hear what she has to say. Inez froze, the look on her face one of blank astonishment, and Alba narrowed her eyes slightly in irritation. I'm not doing you a favor, girl, she snapped, but your idea is a good one. Inez, who shrunk a bit at the sharpness in Alba's tone, nodded humbly. Go on, said Alba impatiently. The girl swallowed hard, clearly bracing herself, then looked up. They're going to need an extra push of propulsion to get through the portal, I think, from the supplementary thrust system, at least that's what they're saying. We can't just destroy fuel cells because we need enough to get turned around and started back for home. But the supplementary thrust burners use a different fuel. We could destroy that. I don't think they'll dare try to get through the portal without them. Alba raised her eyebrows in surprise and gave the girl a brusque nod of approval. Not bad, she said, and again, Inez froze, but the glance she turned on Alba a moment later 
contained a gratitude that was both unexpected and, Alba was forced to concede, completely undeserved. Alba narrowed her eyes at the small twinge of guilt that followed the thought and snorted at her own foolishness. She turned to the others. I think, as Inez said, this is our best option. I suspect having the scientist along as an extra pair of hands would be helpful, so, Felio, would you please call him on his wavelink? We'll have to do it tonight. As Felio has reminded us, our time is quickly slipping away. She didn't voice the rest of her thought, that perhaps too much of it had slipped away already. Perhaps they were already too late to prevent what was coming. Chapter 24 Savina No one stopped their small group as they walked, and Savina was glad. One look at the captain's mutinous expression told her that had she shot down an innocent crew member in front of the woman, Josca may well have crossed her arms stubbornly and refused to move a step farther, threats notwithstanding. As it was, though, no one cast them a second glance in their crew uniforms, and she didn't even need to use the stolen IDs. On a ship this big, they could simply blend in. She herded her captives into a small, neat cabin, which had apparently belonged to her victim, and closed and locked the door behind them. Then she leaned against it, crossing her arms and smiling. Reluctantly, Josca and Raphael took their seats on the small cot and the chair in front of the desk, and Benny sat as well. I checked through the ship's log with my access from the new ID, Savina said, once everyone was seated. The ship will be through the portal in just over twelve planetary hours. I, for one, have no intention of being trapped in alien airspace. So, she turned to her sibling, Benny, have you looked at the security protocols surrounding the judge? Benny nodded. Yes, like we guessed, the entire diplomatic floor is covered by advanced security. It's nothing you and I haven't dealt with before, but it will take me some time to work through it. I'm usually more familiar with the systems before we go in. They paused a moment. I checked the records on Nicolau as well. He's safe at the moment. Savina breathed a quick sigh of relief. At least word hadn't gotten back yet. I assume the Chief Justice follows the ship schedule? She asked. Benny nodded again. Morning watch to evening watch, and she sleeps during night watch, it looks like. Midnight ship's time is in about six planetary hours, said Savina. Can you do what you need to by then? Benny hesitated. I'll do my best, they said at last, but I can't make any promises. It would be easier if I had more time. Savina bit her lip. What if I were to sabotage the ship, give us some extra time? Benny gave her a small smile. Like we did on Almeida? they asked. Savina grinned at the memory, the knot in her chest loosening just a little. Just like on Almeida. Benny nodded. I'll go through the ship's databases and send you some specs. We just want to slow it down, right? No need to disable it entirely? I wouldn't mind disabling it entirely if that was the easiest option, Savina began. But Josca, who had been scowling silently at her through the course of the exchange, said quietly, We're too far out in space for a rescue. You'd very likely be condemning this entire ship and every person aboard it to a slow, agonizing death. And I don't believe you'd do that, Savina. Because if you did, believe me that I would blow up my own ship rather than let you walk away from this. Savina rolled her eyes heavenward. Fine. Just to keep Josca from scolding us all day, try to find me something I can break that will be fixable. Benny, who appeared to be fighting back a smile, nodded. Savina turned her glare on Josca. And you two are bloody well going to help Benny, like good little crew. And you're going to be very, very careful not to arouse any suspicion. Because right now the plan is that Benny and I will do our best to keep the ship functional. But if something were to happen and someone got suspicious, I'd have no more incentive for people not to get hurt. Josca returned her glare with interest, but nodded curtly. Savina gave her a friendly smile. Good. I knew I could count on you. She ignored Josca's dirty look and turned back to Benny. The ID I got you should get you into whatever database you need. If you can't get into somewhere, I'm in security, so I can probably extend your access authorization. 
She gave the others her trademark friendly smile, then turned and slipped out the door. She pulled up the crew list on her retinal screens as she strode down the corridor, flicking her eyes to scan through it until she saw a familiar name. Nicolas Olaire. Her heart skipped a little in her chest, a rush of memories washing over her, her baby brother's tiny, chubby face looking up at her from a mess of dirty blankets. Benny's horrified expression as they ran their small hands over his face and shoulders and pudgy arms. The strange, empty ache in Savina's own arms when she lowered her bundle gently onto the doorstep of the bright, cheerful farm cottage, then tapped on the door, grabbed Benny's hand, and ran. A half-caught view of a toddler laughing as the farmer spun him around in the farmyard, her eyes soft with affection, his bright with excitement. A cheerful, pudgy five-year-old tossing pebbles at a fence post with a small dog following at his heels. The sight of him obscured through the branches of the tree Savina was hiding in. The terror on the farmer's face at Savina's whispered warning from the roof of the cottage, the way the woman's eyes had gone wide in the moonlight, how she'd snatched up the sleepy, crying Nicola and hushed him as her husband threw food and clothing into a bundle. The woman's quiet tone as she's told Savina they'd take her with them if she wanted, despite the fear clear on her face. The way Savina's chest had ached with the desire to say yes, how she'd forced herself to shake her head no, because Nicolau wasn't safe, not yet. A few hours later, standing in front of the now abandoned cottage, looking up at the grim-faced men and women from the compound who'd been sent with her, widening her eyes, telling them she was sure the farmer and her family were inside, hiding. She'd been a good liar, even at twelve. And then, when they'd entered the empty house, bending quickly over the stacks of straw doused with lamp oil they'd set at the door, a lit incendiary in her hand and the plex windows of the farmhouse twisted and melting, the door gaping open, flames shooting from the roof, the screams from inside, of the adults who'd accompanied her, the sharp pain of her fingernails cutting through the skin of her palms. It had been the first time she'd killed someone. The expressions on the faces of the others in the compound when she'd returned alone explained there had been an accident. The family with the kidnapped old believer child had been killed, of course, but the others who'd been sent with Savina had been caught in the blaze. She'd always been skilled at looking innocent. She'd kept track of Niccolo since then, of course, but she'd never tried to find him. The head order of the compound had been suspicious of her story even after seeing the burned farmhouse, and she and Benny had thrown themselves into the business of the compound with all the fervor they could muster. Because not to do that might confirm the head order's suspicion that Nicolau had survived. Nicolau hadn't been important, not really, an infant meant to die, but the fact that he hadn't, the fact that he'd been raised by a family of Orthodox, was a stain on the compound that couldn't be washed away in anything but blood. And so she and Benny had stayed, their lives for his, and she'd never seen him since. And now here she was. Her hands shook, just a little. He was working the main deck, and she found her steps slowing slightly as she approached it. She closed her eyes for just a moment, took a deep breath, and stepped inside. She hadn't seen him, not in person, for years, but she picked him out almost immediately, a tall, broad-shouldered young man with a friendly smile and light brown skin, its tone a match to her own, but she had to put a hand to her mouth to stifle a quick gasp. His hair. It wasn't black like it had been when he was a child. It was a bright auburn, like hers, like Benny's. And he probably didn't even realize the danger it put him in. She clenched her teeth. Thank goodness she'd come back. She and Benny would have to think of a way to deal with this, but only after... First thing was to keep him from getting killed. He had a provision sack slung over one shoulder and was laughing, his face turned towards another crew member working alongside him. Something caught in her chest as she watched him, a stinging ache growing behind her eyes. She and Benny had saved him, but he'd never known them. He had his own life now, his friends, his world, and she was going to blow it to pieces because it was that, or let the judge kill him. She watched until he had crossed the deck with his long, leisurely strides and disappeared behind one of the doors. Then at last, slowly, she turned. I found him, she whispered into her wavelink. You did? How is he? Benny answered immediately. He's fine. He looks happy. 
She cleared her throat. Anyway, now that we know he's safe, I'm going to go through the security protocols. She made her way back to the office where she'd found her uniform and ID. By the time she reached it, she'd regained most of her composure, and when no one was in the corridor to see, she slipped inside the office. She closed and locked the door, sat down in the comfortable seat behind the desk, and, bringing up the ship's system on the desk's holodisc, tapped into the system. She smiled to herself as she paged through the information. The planning part of a job was familiar and soothing, a reminder that despite everything that had gone sideways in the last few days, she knew her work and was good at it. At last, the lights in the ship shifted, signaling the upcoming change to the night shift. Savina pushed back her chair, preparing to stand and stretch the kinks from her back, when a small, flashing communication on the screen caught her eye. She frowned, pushing her chair back into the desk and tapping open the communication. The timestamp read, half a planetary hour ago. Her frown deepened. It was a request to come aboard. She'd checked and double-checked as they approached the ship. There was no legitimate reason for someone to request to board, let alone for the request to be accepted. That's why Benny had had to work so hard to forge their qualifications. Cold grew in the pit of her stomach as she tapped the screen, examining the underlying file more closely. The request had come in 45 standard minutes ago. It had been granted half a standard hour ago. The ship had docked. The file had been closed. And some part of her knew, even before she pulled up the specs on the unknown ship, who it would be. A small, one-person ship, with a modern design and heavy weaponry, registered to a RECA Solar, government agent. She closed down the communication, and for a few moments she sat at the desk, staring at nothing. At last she murmured, Activate. When her wavelength came online, she whispered, Benny? Savina? What's wrong? Benny's voice radiated concern. We're going to have to speed this up, she said quietly. I'll sabotage the ship as soon as I can get through. Once the ship's alarm goes off, it should be easier for me to slip past the judge's security. We have to kill her tonight and get off the ship. What? Benny began, then stopped suddenly. It's her, isn't it? They said at last in a small voice. How did she follow us here? Savina shook her head grimly. I don't know, but it doesn't really matter. We kill the judge and get out, or we all die. And Nicolau dies as well. Chapter 25 Aran Aran surveyed the small company assembled in the corridor, his stomach churning uneasily. They'd all simply assumed that he'd be the one leading them, which was honestly absurd, considering he was pretty certain not a single one of them, not even the girl, Inez, who looked like she'd startle if someone blinked at her, was as viscerally uncomfortable with human interaction as he was. He let out a short, quick breath of combined nerves and frustration, not like anyone in the group had anything to recommend them when it came down to it. Their sabotage team consisted of himself, with whose flaws he was thoroughly and intimately acquainted, a timid, nervous Inez, Yosip, who had to be at least seventy years old, and who, although adept at leaning against the corridor wall and striking up a friendly conversation with anyone who had time to burn, did not look like someone who'd hold his own in a physical altercation, and Istve, whose face was still drawn and pained and who seemed to have trouble standing up without holding on to something. Aran had tried to insist they stay behind, but they got that stubborn look on their face, and he'd realized with a sinking feeling that it was useless. Istve was coming, whether he liked it or not. And Ani, of course, she was huddled on his shoulder, currently making herself as small as possible, having obviously picked up on the mood of the group. Well, he said, I guess we should get going. He started down the hallway, the others following his lead. He'd put Istve in the middle of the small group, where they were protected by him and Ani in front, and Inez and Yosip behind. It wasn't much, but it made Aran feel a little better, at least. The glare Istve shot him, told him they knew exactly what he was doing and were not impressed. But at this point, Aran couldn't possibly have cared less. Just let Istve get out of this alive, and then they could be as angry about it as they wanted. It was the hour of shift change on board the ship, and the corridors were quiet. They picked their way carefully, Aran keeping an eye on Ani for any sign that she'd noticed a threat. 
but she stayed huddled into a ball on his shoulder, her tentacles gripping his shirt with the tightness of nerves, but not of alarm. The engine room was five floors down, on its own separate deck. He hadn't been down there before, although Istve probably had. They'd always been fascinated by how things ran. The trip itself couldn't have taken more than half a standard hour, but it felt like forever. By the time he stepped off the lifts onto the first floor, Aran's nerves were wound so tightly that he could have sworn each footstep was loud enough to alert the guards. Everything on this floor is technically the engine room, Istve whispered from behind him. The fuel storage is about halfway down this corridor on the left-hand side. It'll be its own sealed room, near the center of the ship. Aran nodded, and they started forward again. At the door, Istve indicated, Aran stepped back and Yosip took his place in the front. Yosip pulled out a small electronic lockpick kit and set about fastening it to the door lock, and Aran watched him, eyebrows raised. From the way Yosip used the lockpick, he obviously had some familiarity with it. Got it, Yosip said at last, satisfaction in his voice. He straightened, tapping the lock pad, and the door slid open quietly. Aran glanced around again at their small group and sighed. Inez, he said at last, can you stand watch? If there's trouble, just give us warning. Don't try to be a hero. She gave a trembling nod, her fingers fidgeting unconsciously with the religious icon on the chain around her neck. At least she could move quickly if someone or something appeared, which couldn't be said for anyone else in the group but him and Ani. He contemplated for half a moment leaving Ani to stand guard with her, and then realized it probably wouldn't make the girl feel any better. We'll be as quick as we can, he whispered awkwardly. She nodded again. Yosip laid an encouraging hand on her shoulder, and then he, Aran, and Istve slipped inside the room. What are we looking for? asked Aran once they were inside. Istve squeezed their hand to activate their palm screen, frowning down at it. The supplementary fuel cells look like this, they said, raising their palms so the others could see. Yosip and Aran peered over their shoulder. We'll split up then, said Aran, and the three of them separated and began pulling down the bulky storage boxes to sift through them. By the time an hour had gone by, Aran's back ached from bending over, and the three of them had hardly made a dent in the number of storage boxes. On a trip like this, there was no wasted room. And then, from the other side of the room, Istve called, I found it! Aran and Yosip joined them as they pulled a long, smooth canister out of one of the jumble of cases on the floor and held it up triumphantly. Aran let out a quick breath of relief. Then he and Yosip joined in with a will, pulling down the heavy boxes and wrenching off the lids. According to Ines, we'll need to destroy at least 75% of the canisters to be sure said Yosip. They'll have brought some extra, but even so, that should give us a safe window. He shook his head. Destroying them all would be best, but we've spent too much time down here already. The sooner we get done and get out, the better. How many will they have brought, do you think? Aran grunted, pulling one of the heavy containers from the top of a stack and lowering it to the ground with a thump. Yosip shook his head as he pulled it open. I was talking to one of the boys who works in the cargo and resupply, and he estimated there were at least a hundred and fifty cells. That should be about... He paused, calculating. Thirty cases, give or take. Aran nodded grimly, then turned to snatch the edge of a crate that looked like it was about to fall from Istve's wobbling hands. For heaven's sake, Istve, let me get the boxes down, he snapped. You can hardly stand up. How are we going to sabotage them? Istve grunted as they and Aran set the carton on the ground. They swayed a little as they straightened, and Aran grabbed for their arm. We're going to get Ani to spray them with her acid, he said through his teeth. I checked through the chemical fingerprint of the supplementary fuel. Her acid should ruin the cells without causing them to explode. Istve, for the love of everything holy, go sit down. Istve shook their heads stubbornly. We don't have time. Aran sucked in a short exasperated breath, then glanced over to where Yosip was pulling down a carton that looked heavier than he was. 
Aran swore through his teeth and strode over, helping the older man lower the crate. He should have left one of those two out in the hallway, since apparently Inez was the only other able-bodied person on their damn sabotage crew. They'd only gotten about ten cases opened when there was a sharp tap on the door. Aran glanced up absently from where he was working. He'd finally managed to convince the others to let him take down the boxes, so Yosip and Istve were unloading the cylinders, and at first he thought someone had dropped one. And then he realized and swore, tapping his palm screen. Inez, what is it? There are people coming down the corridor, she whispered, her voice shaking. They're not here yet, but my scanner's picking them up. There's at least a dozen of them, and it looks like they're armed. They'll be turning the corner any second. Aran swore again. Run! Just get away. We'll deal with what happens in here. There's nowhere to run. Her voice was almost too quiet to make out. There are more people coming from the other side. What is it? asked Istve, turning. Get in here, then, Aran whispered. We'll lock the door from the inside. If it's a regular security detail, they should just pass by. The door opened a crack, and Inez slipped inside, her thin body shaking with nerves. She closed the door behind her and hit the lock, and the four of them stood, listening in frozen silence for the footsteps. A moment later, they came, the sharp click of heavy boots along the corridor. Even through the locked door, Aran could hear the muffled murmur of their conversation. He took a deep breath, stroking one of Ani's tentacles to quiet her. It was probably just the regular security detail. As long as there was no noise to alert them, there'd be no reason for them to... The footsteps stopped directly outside the door. Aran glanced around quickly, then shoved Inez towards Yosip, who was frantically beckoning them back into the maze of boxes. No time now to try to hide what they'd been doing. He grabbed Istve by the shoulder, pushing them ahead of him, and sprinted after Yosip and Inez. Istve pushed through the small gap where the other two had disappeared, and Aran followed as the door hissed open. There were a few moments of silence as whoever had entered the room took in the scene. "'What the hell is going on in here?' a harsh female voice snapped. The question was clearly rhetorical. Yosip had found a narrow opening through boxes, and although it meant they'd all had to go down practically on hands and knees to get through, the four of them had managed to wedge themselves in close, beside the rear wall of the fuel storage. Aran turned, peering into the center of the room through the cracks in the boxes. Then he frowned, and beside him he felt Istve stiffen as well. Those aren't ship security, Istve mouthed. They're soldiers. Aran met his friend's eyes. Istve looked as grim as Aran felt. Whatever this was, it didn't bode well for either the sabotage attempt or the diplomatic mission. One of the soldiers was bending over the pile of cylinders Istve had been laying out on the floor, in preparation for Ani's acid to do its work. "'It's the supplementary fuel cells,' he said in a gruff voice, straightening. "'I don't know what they were doing with them, but—' He broke off suddenly. "'If that damn scientist is behind it, or that bloody chief justice, it has to be sabotage,' said the woman who must be the captain. Her voice was flat and deadly. "'We obviously interrupted them,' It looks like the seals aren't broken on all the cases yet. She glanced over her shoulder at the other soldiers. Spread out and find them. There's a good chance they're still in the room, but it's a damn good thing that government agent walked in and introduced herself just in time for us to lock her up. Even if we have to move sooner than we expected, at least we had a heads up that old cow of a judge was planning something. Aran cursed under his breath. The soldiers spread out and set to work, pulling down boxes methodically. There were a dozen of them, and they were working much faster than he, Istve, and Yosip had managed. It wouldn't take them more than thirty standard minutes to clear the room, and there was no way past them to the door, and watching them, Aran was suddenly very certain that, if the motley sabotage team was found, they wouldn't be taken to the brig and brought before a tribunal. They wouldn't leave this room alive. Something stirred on his shoulder, and he clamped his mouth shut on another curse. Ani, no, he whispered, grabbing instinctively at Ani's tentacles, then loosening his grip before she could sting him. Ani could kill the soldiers, certainly, every last one of them, 
but they had military-class uniforms with embedded sensors, and if even one of them was killed, an alert would go up across the entire ship. It wouldn't be long before the place was crawling with soldiers with guns. And, yes, Ani would be happy to take on the entire ship if given the motivation, but she couldn't take all of them out at once. Even if she survived the resultant shootout, he and Istve and the others almost certainly would not. Besides which, he wasn't sure he was quite ready to turn the ship into a bloodbath, and if Ani went on the rampage, a bloodbath it would be. Yosip, his face grim, had reached into his jacket and was pulling out his pistol. Aran, he whispered, if you and I stay here and start shooting, we may be able to hold the soldiers' attention while the other two run for it. Istve's eyes narrowed. Like, hell, I'm going to... They began. Inez interrupted them. I've... I pulled the ship's schematics while we've been waiting, she said, her voice barely a whisper. There's a cooling vent opening, not too far from where we are right now. It's wide enough we should be able to fit inside, and it'll bring us out somewhere near the lift. I... I know it's not perfect, but at least it's something. They all turned to stare at her. Aron cursed himself quietly. Why hadn't he thought to go through the ship's schematics, instead of sitting there watching the soldiers like a damn fool? Could you find the vent opening for us, do you think? asked Yosef gently. The girl was squeezing her religious icon so tightly Aron was almost surprised it hadn't snapped. She nodded and gestured for them to follow. The four of them crept along the walls, sucking in to squeeze through the narrow gap. At last, Inez crouched in an area that had obviously been left to allow air to circulate. Right here, she whispered. Yosip crouched beside her, pulling out his lockpick, and Aran glanced worriedly at Istve. His friend's face was drawn, their teeth clenched in grim determination, and they looked almost dead on their feet. When he glanced down again, Inez and Yosip had removed the vent, and Yosip was placing it gently on the ground. You go first, he whispered to Inez. You know the way. The rest of us will follow. Inez bobbed her head in a tiny nod and started off down the gaping tunnel on hands and knees. Aran gestured Yosip forward. Ani and I will go last. Yosip nodded and started after Inez. You next, whispered Aran, turning to Istve. For a moment, they looked like they were going to argue. You really think anything could hurt me with Ani on my shoulder? Aran hissed in irritation. Istve let out a long, suffering sigh, but they dropped to their knees and followed Yosip. Aran looked dubiously into the dark tunnel and took a long, steadying breath. Being killed by soldiers was objectively worse even than small, dark spaces, he reminded himself. He dropped to his hands and knees and started after the others pausing to reach awkwardly around behind him and set the grating loosely against the vent opening. It wouldn't fool anyone for long, but it might give them a few additional seconds. It was pitch black inside the ventilation tunnel, and the sounds were abnormally loud in the darkness, the scuff of knees and boots against the smooth surface of the tunnel, the way their breathing echoed. The smell of his own sweat and fear, a soft curse from ahead of him where Istve must have bumped against something. The walls were narrow enough that Aran could feel the roof against his back, and his shoulders almost brushed the walls on each side. He closed his eyes, even though in the dark it made no difference whatsoever, and began counting backwards from 100, 87, 86, 85. His fingers tapped a soft rhythm on the floor in time with his count. He wasn't going to panic. They weren't going to be in here forever. They'd get to the end soon. His breath was coming faster, his throat tightening. Aran? Istve whispered over their shoulder, concern in their voice. Are you all right? He couldn't answer, at least not truthfully. He was so far from all right, it was laughable. And then, from ahead, Inez's timid voice. I'm at the end. Aran took a deep breath, refraining himself with an effort from shoving his way forward until he could push through into the open air. He'd be out in a moment. It would be fine. He could hear the shuffling as Inez and Yosip switched places, the soft, metallic ting of the lockpick. And then the striated shadows ahead were replaced with a solid square of light through which he could see the white of the hallways.
He sucked in a breath, only the residual dizziness making him realize how long he'd been holding it. He waited until Istve was out, then forced his shaking muscles to move at a deliberate pace rather than a panicked rush as he clambered out of the dark hole. He straightened in the corridor, leaning up against the wall, and closed his eyes against the sickening dizziness. He felt Istve's hand on his arm, and he clung to the sensation. It was fine. They'd all be fine. When he'd recovered sufficiently, he opened his eyes and turned to the others. They were watching him, and he tried to force a smile. Let's get out of here while we still can, he whispered. Yosip, who was crouched on the floor replacing the vent cover, stood, shaking his head grimly. There's no way we get back down here again once we leave, not with the security they'll put in after this. We'll deal with it when we get out of this alive, said Istve through their teeth. Let's go. Aran set a quick pace for the lifts, and the others followed. He could hear, faintly, the noise of a dozen soldiers from inside the fuel storage room, but apparently no one had noticed their escape yet. When the lift let them out on the second floor, he could feel his muscles go weak with relief. They'd made it out alive. Istve was right. The rest they could deal with later. Their small group started briskly down the almost empty corridor, Aran in the lead, to the lifts that led to the diplomatic section of the ship. Aran turned a corner and almost ran into a young woman in the uniform of a crew member. She had wide eyes, a broad, pleasant face, and an innocent smile, the picture of a country girl fresh from the mountains. Hello, she said in a friendly voice. She paused a moment. I'm sorry to bother you, but I saw some soldiers heading in the direction you're coming from. Is anything wrong? Aran gave a quick shake of his head. No, I think they were headed for the engine room. She hesitated, then sighed. Well, I don't want trouble with soldiers. I'll come back later. She paused a moment. I didn't realize there were that many soldiers on board. Nor did I, said Aran grimly. If you'll excuse me. She nodded and stepped to one side, and they made their way quickly past her. They were almost at the main lift. Aran could feel the tension in his shoulders loosening just a little. And then, just as they reached the lift doors, a voice called out from behind him. It was so entirely unexpected and so impossibly, horribly familiar that he froze. Aran, said Emmerich, where are you going in such a hurry? I think we should sit down and have a talk. Chapter 26 Savina Savina stared after the ragged group stumbling towards the lift. Half of them looked terrified out of their minds, and the other half looked like they were about to keel over. But their words had confirmed the sense of unease that had been tightening around her chest. Something was wrong. Something was very, very wrong, and it appeared sabotage was suddenly off the table. For a long moment, she hesitated. In the end, it wasn't much of a choice. She didn't have time to spare. She had to kill the judge tonight, and then she and Benny had to get off the ship. Benny, she whispered into her wavelink. There's been a change of plans. I'll have to go straight to the Chief Justice. There was a moment of silence from the other end of the line, then Benny's voice. All right, they said, worry thick in their tone. I have all the specs, and I'll send them through to you. But without any distraction, the plan I came up with... It's either I go in now, or we're all killed before we can leave this damn ship, Savina snapped. I'd rather take my chances with the judge. Benny didn't answer. A moment later, the security details flashed across Savina's retinal screen. She scanned through them. Thanks, she said shortly. If you don't hear from me in three hours, something's gone wrong. Get Nicola if you can, and get off the ship. Call me if you get into trouble, please, said Benny. The familiar worry in their tone stiffened Savina's resolve. This wasn't about revenge, although she had to admit that killing the woman who had haunted her nightmares since childhood would be immensely satisfying. It wasn't even about money. This was about keeping Benny and her baby brother alive. This was about everything she'd worked for and suffered for her entire life. This was a matter of survival. She remembered the government agent's face, her cold smile and mocking eyes, the way she'd tried to slide her knife across Savina's throat, and how Savina had, for a moment, been unable to breathe, half because of the knife and half because of the breathtaking antagonism in those cold eyes. 
She shivered at the sudden, unsettling thrill of the memory. A very immediate matter of survival in her case. Getting past the security between the second and third floor, and then into the diplomatic section of the ship, took longer than she'd expected. Still, it was only half an hour past midnight, ship's time, when she stepped at last into the corridor where the Chief Justice was housed. She wiped the blood fastidiously from her fingers onto her dark trousers. She liked dark trousers for the fact they didn't really show bloodstains, and then started at a nonchalant pace down the hallway. Benny would have disabled the cameras, and the blood on her fingers bore testament to the fact there would be no guards coming down the hallway until the next shift. She reached the judge's door and pulled out a lockpick, slipping it into the sensor and moving it deftly. A moment later, the lock clicked, and she pushed the door open just enough to allow her to slip through. Once inside, she blinked to activate the infrared on her retinal screen and scanned the room. She frowned, scanning it again more slowly, then she swore. Alba wasn't here. Savina, did something happen? Benny's voice was even more worried than usual. Savina couldn't blame them. Neither she nor Benny was used to a single job going as badly as every last damn thing had gone over the past few days. Where the hell would a 70-something-year-old woman go at bloody midnight? She whispered through her teeth. She's gone? The worry in Benny's tone was sharpening. If that damned Josca warned her, Savina began, murder in her voice. She couldn't have. I put a block on her wavelength. She couldn't have contacted anyone but me. Benny paused. Maybe the judge moved to a different schedule and it wasn't updated on the databases. Savina gave a grunt of irritation and tapped the wavelength off. Wherever she was, the woman couldn't possibly stay out all night. It didn't matter when she was killed, really, as long as it was quick. She glanced around the small cabin, the judge's desk, and in it, a locked drawer that looked around the right size to contain a hollow disk safe. In a few deft motions, Savina had the lock on the drawer open, and then, a few moments later, the safe itself. The judge had decent security, but Savina had broken into so many safes she could have done it in her sleep. She found the mission disks relatively quickly and pulled them out. They were encrypted, of course, but the codebreaker set into her wavelength was the most advanced on the market, and it made short work of even the government ciphers. She pulled one open and tapped it to her wrist, and watched the transcribed words scroll slowly across her retinal screen. Diplomatic mission to the aliens in order to bring back a cure for the defect. Confident that a peaceful solution is possible and indeed vital if we wish to advance our overall objective to remove the military's position as a branch of government. Wisest course of action, taking into account the fact that there have been no wars or major hostilities in the past several decades. The last major episode of intergroup hostilities was the cleansing, the sectarian violence inflicted by the Orthodox Church against the so-called Old Believers, or Corpus Day sect, at the turn of the last century, can prove diplomacy's ability to solve problems without resorting to bloodshed, as long as a cold unease spread through her as she scanned the briefings. She'd known from the moment she'd heard about this so-called diplomatic mission that it was a front to finally wipe out the old believers. The Orthodox Church and its government supporters wouldn't admit it publicly and risk warning their victims, of course, but in the Judge of Heretics' private briefings, they'd have no such concerns. But it wasn't there. No wars or major hostilities in the past several decades, the cleansing, the sectarian violence inflicted by the Orthodox Church against the so-called old believers. The turn of the last century, it was a lie just like everything else. It had to be. Orthodox propaganda, something to make her and the rest of the old believers let down their guard. There was no way everything her mother had told her, everything she'd learned as a child, every terror-filled nightmare she'd woken from, sobbing only to see the confirmation of her fears in her parents' faces. There was no way that could be false. It was impossible. The purpose of the mission was to kill the old believers, it must be, but she found herself scrambling desperately now, pulling up the rest of the handfuls of discs, more of the private files, private council notes from the days and weeks leading up to the mission. Highest priority must be to maintain the ability of the government as an entity to preserve a peaceful and orderly society, which leads to the inescapable conclusion 
that General Cavaco and the military branch be disbanded. She read through the words again. She must have missed something. She had to have missed something or misunderstood the words. Why would the judge of heretics want the military committee disbanded? It made no sense. General Cavaco would be the one leading the armed forces to seize the old believers when Alba made her pronouncement. That's what they'd always told her in the compound. Maybe the chief justice just wanted the military under her own control, that was all. Maybe she was worried that even General Cavaco would balk at the orders she was planning to give. But, even as Savina thought it, it felt uncomfortably false. It was the judge of heretics and the head of the military committee, working hand in hand, who'd destroy the compound and everyone in it, torture the children to death in front of their family's eyes, and then burn the adults alive. That was what the head order had preached Savina's whole life. But... It had been the head order of her own compound who decided her baby brother should die, her own mother who placed her crying infant, no more than a week old, into a hole in the ground to be buried alive as he screamed in terror. It had been Savina, twelve years old, who'd burned people alive for it. Work towards outreach and education for cult members and fanatical groups of whatever religious or other persuasion, and by reducing the influence of the military in decision-making, avoid a repeat of the Swan River Massacre a decade ago. We are confident that with increased educational opportunities, as well as community outreach, we can... There was a picture further on in the briefing, President Ander Seguer. He was pale-skinned with mousy brown hair, and standing behind him in his circle of ministers was another man, clearly a counselor, brown-skinned, but with hair of an incongruent, bright auburn an old believer then, or at least someone from old believer stock. She reached up unconsciously, touching her own hair. How long had she kept its color hidden, her whole life? Because she'd known it would single her out, make her a target whenever Alba and Cavaco finally made their move. They always told her, in the compound, that anyone she saw outside with that distinctive auburn hair and brown skin was a dupe at best, a slave at worst. But this was a member of the government, one of the president's own ministers. A dupe, maybe, but a powerful one, if so. It was propaganda, lies, it must be. It had been planted here for her, except it hadn't, because the judge had no idea she'd be coming. No one had known. The warrant Reka had been carrying hadn't mentioned Savina's religion, just her career and the counselor she'd killed three months ago. Savina hadn't lost sleep over that killing any more than any other... The woman had been orthodox, and Savina had known, deep in her bones, that the woman would have done the same to her if given the chance. She wouldn't have needed even the slight justification of a payment. She was orthodox and a counselor, and therefore her whole life had been dedicated to the destruction of Savina and everyone like her. Except, except, surely Alba's private briefings would have mentioned something? Surely, if this had all been part of the plot to kill the old believers, it would have been mentioned, at least. Scattered throughout the briefings and council notes, there were some relevant articles from the recent news packets. She scanned through them, unable to make herself stop. Celebration of religious freedom in the capital. Parades move down the Vermelhas Boulevard. Monument to those killed in the cleansing raised in Flores de Memoira Square. Under the headline, a picture of a glowing hollow statue where tired, noble-looking people, adults and children both, sank down to their knees, hands outstretched, faces resolute at the prospect of death. The plaque under it read, In memory of those who died for their convictions. Numbness was spreading through her, so she wasn't sure, really, if her body still belonged to her. She'd known about these things, She'd read them in the news packets, seen the statue herself. She'd always assumed they were a ploy, a cynical manipulation on the part of the people in power to lure the remnants of the old believers into complacence. But now, no matter how far she read, no matter how deep into the briefings she searched, there was no mention of a plot against the old believers, except for what had happened a century past. No mention of religion at all except as a side note, a news article about preparations for one of the customary religious holidays, 
where a holographic icon would be paraded through the streets to cheering crowds, perhaps, but clearly more an excuse to celebrate than a demonstration of religious fervor. A mention of a man attacking a youth, shouting slurs about their beliefs, and a note that the man had been taken into custody and charged. When the scrolling stopped, Savina sank onto the cot, her legs suddenly unwilling to hold her up. Her head was spinning, her stomach uneasy with nausea. It couldn't have been a lie. It was her whole life. It was everything she'd known, everything she'd ever been told. Her whole life had been based on an existential struggle. Her and her family and their small, remote compound against a system engaged in a holy war dedicated to their destruction. It had been the only thing that had given meaning to her desperate fight for survival, the beatings she'd endured, and the ones she'd watched Benny take. Perhaps it had been bad, but it had been better than the alternative, better than the horrific, corrupt system outside their compound. It gave her something to hold on to while she stifled her sobs and curled in on her bruises. When she was young and stupid, it had been for the mystery's sake, the mystery made flesh who'd smiled down on her benevolently and blessed her suffering. And then, when she'd grown too old to believe that, it was because the rest of the world was a place that would kill her because of the beliefs of her parents. The world was evil, and what she'd suffered was acceptable, because it was better than what would have happened to her outside. She felt like she was floating, her mind not quite attached to the rest of her. Savina! The voice through her wavelength jerked her out of her stupor, but it took a moment for her sluggish thoughts to recognize the voice as Benny's, and the note in it as panic. Savina, you have to get out of there. There are people... The communication broke off abruptly. Savina jerked to her feet. Benny, what happened? Benny, are you... The door to the judge's cabin burst open, and a group of grim-faced soldiers stepped through. Who are you? snapped the leader, turning to glare at Savina. Why are you in Alba's cabin? Are you colluding with her? We caught that government agent she called in. Are you working with her? This must be one of the crew she subverted, said another of the soldiers. She turned over her shoulder. Take her! Soldiers grabbed for her. Savina slipped easily free of their grasping hands, the threat waking muscle memory, even if her brain was still sluggish and slow. She yanked out a short, deadly sharp knife, plunging it into the throat of the soldier who'd grabbed for her, and as the woman collapsed, Choking in a spray of blood, Savina spun, jerking her pistol out of her boot. She got off three shots and sent three soldiers down before someone else sprang forward. She turned with the knife, slashing at her attacker's arm, but their body armor turned the blade, leaving only a surface-deep cut. The soldier grabbed her, yanking her arm around behind her back, but she stomped her foot on the floor, a small blade in the toe of her boot clicking out and kicked, aiming for soft tissue below her captor's knee. The man dropped, grunting in agony, and Savina yanked her arm free, and then something slammed into the back of her head and she staggered, the world wavering in front of her eyes. There was the whistling hum of a bolus, and a thin cord caught around her ankles, the three hard balls slamming painfully against her calves. She stumbled, and another bolus struck her and wrapped around her torso, pinning one arm to her side. She yanked a knife from the sheath behind her neck with her free hand and flung it, and had the satisfaction of watching a soldier stagger back, clutching at her face. And then, someone had her by her other arm and slapped an electric trank onto her wrist. The shock jolted through her, freezing her muscles. By the time it released, she was thoroughly bound. The leader stepped forward, his eyes narrow, and slapped Savina hard across the face. Savina spat out a curse against the pain of the blow, but it was half-hearted. Even the sight of the cabin, spattered now with blood, wasn't enough to rouse any emotion other than a faint, distant despair. What did it matter at this point? She was dragged out of the cabin and down a corridor, then another. She couldn't force her numb mind to pay attention to the twists and turns. It couldn't be a lie. Her entire life couldn't be a lie. The looks on her parents' faces, the fear, the sorrow... The soldiers shoved her roughly into an empty cabin. She lost her footing and fell hard on her face, unable to catch herself with bound hands. The man who'd shoved her laughed. 
Don't worry, he crooned. I'm sure we'll find a way to make your death painful. You like violence. You showed us that. We'll see how much you enjoy it when it's turned on you. He stepped back, and the door slid shut. There was the click of a lock, then another click, which must have been an exterior lock. Even if she still had her lockpick somewhere on her, she wouldn't be able to get through that. She rolled painfully over. Now that the adrenaline of the fight was fading, she could feel the bruises rising across her face and along her body, the latest ones on her knees and elbows where she'd tried to catch herself as she fell, the throbbing ache in her shoulder from the pulse wound two days earlier. She could guess now why Benny's communication had cut off so quickly. It looked like the soldiers were going through all the crew who they hadn't predetermined were on the general's side, which, thanks to her disguises, likely meant Benny, Raphael, Josca, as well as her. They hadn't asked for any of this. Josca had been dragged into it, and despite Savina's lingering irritation over the thruster repair and the payment of past fees, she'd saved Savina's life. She'd done it more than once, and now she'd die for it. Savina lay where she'd fallen, staring up at the blank, sterile white of the ceiling in the cramped ship's cabin that had become her prison. This time, when the tears burned at the corners of her eyes, no amount of blinking would push them back. Chapter 27. Alba. Where the hell are they? Alba snapped. Felu looked up, faintly shocked. He shouldn't be. Just because she put on a refined face for the idiots on the council didn't mean she couldn't swear when the occasion demanded. But then, Felu had seemed genuinely shocked earlier that day at being gestured by Josip, who had clearly meant it as a friendliness, to sit in the chair. He'd stood stiffly at her back for a while, and finally, at her irritated insistence, taken a ginger seat on the edge of one of the smaller stools. "'I'm not certain, madam,' he said at last, and she heard the concern in his tone. "'Time,' she snapped, flicking her eyes to activate the wavelength and glancing at the retinal display in the corner of her vision. "'Well past twenty-three, hundred hours, ship's time. The others had been gone three full hours by now.' She shook her head and pushed herself from her chair. "'Has anyone contacted you?' she asked the clerk. He shook his head. "'No, madam, I'm sorry.' She leaned against the desk with one hand, closing her eyes for just a moment. There'd been four of them on the sabotage team. Aran, ridiculous as he was, was obviously skilled in matters of survival. His friend, too, probably. And Josip was friends with every person on the entire ship. Apparently, and Inez, timid though she was, was smart, but she'd seen them, gathered in the hallway, Istve, their face drawn and unhealthy, looking barely able to stay on their feet, Josip, smiling and kindly, but as old as Alba herself, and certainly not a fighter, Inez, practically shaking with nerves, and Aran, with soul-deep terror lurking behind his eyes. How long should this have taken them? She asked. It wasn't the first time she'd asked the question, but Felu knew better than to remind her of that when she was in this mood and merely sighed. I think we calculated that it could take them up to two hours by the time they got to the fuel storage room, found what they needed, destroyed it, and then got back up here. And it had been almost three hours. Something's gone wrong, she said. Felu shifted uneasily. Madam, he began, then paused. He wanted to contradict her. She could hear it in his voice, but he couldn't. Because the fact was, she was almost certainly right. Madam, he began again. Be that as it may, I'm not sure what we can... She straightened, pushing back her shoulders like she had decades ago when, as the youngest member of the Judiciary Committee, she'd had to try to fool people into thinking she wasn't terrified every time she stepped into the council building. She was terrified, honestly, but she'd been considering this possibility ever since the others had left, ever since she'd seen them standing there in the corridor and realized what a slim chance they had of making it out of this successfully, or even alive. She ignored the thought, because somehow she couldn't bring herself to imagine any one of those four lying still and cold on a sterile corridor floor. Aran, with his quiet, dreamy smile. Istve, who watched Aran when they knew he wasn't looking, as if he was the most important thing in their world. Nervous, 
timid Inez, with her bright smile when praised, and her clever ideas spoken in a barely audible whisper. Yosip, the way his eyes twinkled, the way he had of making everyone around him feel at ease, even her, although she'd never admit it, even to herself. The thought of any one of them dead, body stiffening, eyes blank and staring. She shook her head resolutely. No, she wouldn't think of it. Well, she said sharply, turning to Felio, thankfully, I have a secondary plan. He stared at her blankly. Madame, if they're not back by now and have not contacted us, the likelihood is that they've either been stopped somehow or captured. She didn't speak, the other possibility allowed, and was unreasonably grateful when Felu refrained as well. Therefore, it appears our opponents are determined to do whatever it takes to advance their agenda. The rest of us be hanged. We tried warning the crew piecemeal and learned quickly that was no solution at all. If they'll kill their lead scientist, certainly they won't hesitate to kill members of the crew. However, she paused a moment, steeling herself. If I am able to broadcast the information via the general communication lines, I believe that might do the trick. I understand my name still holds some sway, even on this ship, on which I'm apparently not the final authority. I very much doubt that even our bloodthirsty friends will be able to kill the entire crew. Logistics of the matter aside, they can't very well pilot the ship without assistance. Felu was staring at her. But, he began... "'Madam, we talked about this. "'If you are broadcasting, they'll know—' "'She glanced at him sharply. "'Yes, they'll know who it came from and where to find me. "'At the time we discussed the option, we were not out of alternatives. "'However—' "'She paused a moment to be certain that her voice wouldn't shake. "'However, it appears the others have not succeeded at their mission. "'And if getting the ship turned around "'and the general population alerted to General Cavaco's perfidy— requires me to be locked up, or, or otherwise incapacitated, I hardly think I can countenance regret at such a sacrifice. He was staring at her, his mouth half open, an expression of horror on his face. Something twisted in her chest, but she couldn't decide if it was gratitude or affection or fear or guilt. Don't bother trying to talk me out of it, she said briskly. I can tell you right now you'll be wasting your breath. I'll... I'll come with you, of course, madam. His voice was uncharacteristically husky. Besides, you'll need someone to set up the broadcast system. She hesitated. But he was right. She'd never needed to know how to set up communication equipment. And there was at least a solid chance that, as she'd be the only one broadcasting, she'd also be the only one whose death would be a necessity. If you choose to come, your assistance would be appreciated she said at last. There seemed to be something caught in her throat, making speaking more difficult than usual. The old clerk nodded and reached down to pick up the pistol on the table, but she caught the suspicious glint in his eyes and found her own eyes watering unaccountably. He brushed his sleeve quickly across his face and, after a moment, cleared his throat respectfully. Madam, he said, his voice gruff, I'm ready if you are. Very well. No use in waiting around, then. She stepped to the door, and it hissed open at her command. She took a deep breath, touching the small, delicate pistol tucked into her coat pocket. She wasn't certain, if it came to it, that she'd have the stomach to use it. Best to hope, then, that she wouldn't have occasion to find out. She stiffened her back and stepped forward in the hallway, Felu following close behind. The moment she stepped out of her cabin, she knew her suspicions were correct. Something was wrong. The ship was a flood of noise and confusion, shouts coming over the general ship lines and through the amplifiers, footsteps running heavily down adjoining corridors. She forced herself to keep walking. She was doing nothing wrong, she reminded herself. Only an evening stroll. The distance to the broadcast dock was not far, according to the directions on her retinal screen, but the moment the lift doors opened, she almost stepped directly into the path of a company of grim-faced soldiers escorting a small huddle of crew and restraints down the corridor. She stepped back quickly, but thankfully they didn't glance in her direction. Madam? Felu whispered from behind her. I'm not certain we'll be able to get through at all, 
let alone in time to make a difference. We're only a few hours away from the portal. She fixed him with her coldest stare. Do you intend to spend your time prophesying doom? Or do you intend to help me? He straightened, shutting his mouth abruptly, and she turned to the corridor. It was empty, at least for the moment, and she stepped forward, praying to any deity that might be listening. Her legs were shaking, but she fought not to let it show. Just before they reached the booth, a soldier rounded the corner at a run and almost plowed into them. Alba shot the woman such a look that the woman mumbled an apology and slunk back like a scolded schoolchild, apologizing shamefacedly before continuing down the corridor. But it wouldn't last. No amount of bluffing could last forever. Alba's lifetime in politics had taught her that. And then they were standing in front of the doorway to the broadcast booth. She braced herself, then placed a hand on the sensor and stepped through the door as it hissed open. The three communications officers turned to stare at them, and Alba gave them a frosty glare. Please conduct me to a booth, immediately, she demanded, praying that none of them were in the general's pay. Who? One of the men began, but the woman next to him elbowed him, and Alba heard her name hissed in a sharp whisper. The man's face went suddenly slack with terror. I'm... I'm sorry, Madam Chief Justice, he said hastily, straightening so quickly it was almost comical. Right away, come with me. She and Filiu follow the man down to the booth. He opened the door and let her in. Will you be needing anything else? he asked nervously. She glanced around. She had no idea how to work any of this equipment, but Felu caught her eye and gave a quick shake of his head. No, she said, that will be all, thank you. He nodded and left, sidling through the door as if she were a dangerous creature he didn't dare turn his back on. When he was gone, Felu locked the door, his shoulders sagging in relief. I didn't think we'd make it this far, he muttered, but let's not push our luck. I assume that you know how to set up this equipment, she snapped nerves making her voice sharper than she intended. He nodded and set to work, placing his pistol on the table to free his hands. She dropped into the chair at the booth, closing her eyes and leaning her head back wearily. Her legs were so shaky she wasn't sure how long they would have held her up anyway. Two weeks ago, the thought of sitting here in a communications booth on a ship that carried thousands of people towards an uncertain future, in full expectation of her death, would have been laughable. If someone had told her, she would have assumed they were drunk, or possibly mad. But here she was. This would be her legacy then. Not the woman who dismantled the military branch of the government, but the woman who'd been murdered trying to prevent a coup. And whether she was vilified for it or lauded for it would depend entirely on whether or not she succeeded. Madam? The huskiness was back in Felu's voice, and he was avoiding her eyes, as if that was enough to keep her from seeing the sheen of tears. He cleared his throat. Madam, it's ready? She closed her eyes for just a moment, and for just a moment allowed herself to regret what had brought her here, but she found, in the end, she couldn't. If she were given these decisions to make again, she would have made each of them in the same way she had. In the end... Perhaps that was a satisfying way to go to one's death, after all. Alba nodded, took a deep breath, and leaned forward as the light above the booth flickered green. Officers, diplomats, members of the crew, she began, in the firm, ringing tones she used to address the council. Her voice was old now, but still clear and resonant as it passed through the communication system, booming out across every amplifier on the main deck. This is Chief Justice Alba Espina. I was appointed by the Council to lead this diplomatic mission. However, I am afraid that both you and I have been sent here under false pretenses. The captain of the ship, among others, is working under the employ of General Cavaco. And, it appears, the General has an interest in our failure, if not our deaths. During the course of our flight, our lead scientist, Aran Romu, discovered fragments of crude ships that were destroyed on the other side of the portal. We do not know yet what this indicates, but common sense dictates that it is not news to be brushed aside. 
The captain has refused to turn the ship around despite my clear orders, nor will he allow us to pause and reconsider our options in light of this new information. She paused a moment. I understand this is an irregular message. However, due to attempts on my life, this was the only option open to me. I would ask, therefore, that as you value your lives, you take matters into your own hands. The ship cannot run uncrewed. I ask... The green light blinked out abruptly, the equipment going suddenly dead. Alba turned. Fail you? She was unable to hide the worry in her tone. Madam, he said, I don't know... There was the crash of something slamming into the locked door. Madam! Failure began, straightening quickly. You must... There was another crash, and this time the door burst open, sagging in on its tracks. The lock shattered. In the doorway stood at least a dozen soldiers. The three in front were carrying heavy shock rams. Behind them, the other soldiers held their pulse rifles. The small, deadly muzzles pointed directly at her. Alba swallowed down her fear and forced herself to push back her chair. She stood, straightening to her full height, which was still barely at the level of Felu's shoulder. A strange peace had settled over her. She was going to die. She'd never know now whether or not she'd succeeded. Perhaps it was for the best. Alba Espina, the lead soldier snapped. Step away from the communications booth now. Alba raised her chin. May I ask the meaning of this? She said in her iciest tone. For a moment, no one moved. Stop talking! Get away from the booth! One of the soldiers shouted, his voice shaking with nerves. Before she could move to obey, she saw his finger tighten on the trigger, his muscles tense as he pulled the gun in tighter to his shoulder. Madam Chief Justice! Failure began, his eyes widening in horror. He threw himself across the room towards her, even as she opened her mouth to shout at him to stay where he was. The barrel of the gun twitched slightly with the kick, and, as if in slow motion, she saw Falu stumble as he stepped in front of her, saw his body sag, saw the red blossom across the crisp white of the shirt he always wore. She saw him slump to the ground, and she heard shouting around her, and saw the soldiers moving forward. But for some reason, she couldn't seem to pay attention to any of it. All she could see was her old clerk's body limp on the floor. It was all she could see, even as they grabbed her roughly, pulling her arms painfully behind her back and fastening them with restraints, as the captain screamed at her subordinate, as someone hauled Phil you up like a cargo sack and shoved Alba ahead of them through the door. All right, Madam Chief Justice, said the squad captain, when Alba was pulled up in front of him. You've caused enough trouble, I think. From now on, you'll stay in your cabin. He grinned. Don't worry, we cleaned the blood off the walls just for you. She was pushed down the corridors, soldiers in front of and behind her, muscles aching at the unaccustomed abuse. But still, all she could see was Felu's limp body, scarlet staining the pristine white of his shirt. In the end, her pistol had done her no good at all. Chapter 28 Iran Iran turned slowly, his heart pounding. Yosip and Inez stood in front of him, frozen, and behind him stood Istve, one hand supporting themselves against the wall, a gun shoved against the back of their head. Emmerich smiled at him from the center of the corridor. Aron, he said again, lovely to see you again, but I really think you should consider... Aron could barely hear him through the fury pounding in his brain. Don't damn well touch Istve, he hissed. Emmerich just had time to look surprised before Aran launched himself forward, slamming into the man standing behind Istve. The pistol went flying, and Aran and the man landed on the ground, grappling. Distantly, he could hear shouts and the dull sound of blows, and he realized, dimly, that the entire corridor behind him had broken out into fighting. He didn't care. He drove his fist into his opponent's face over and over. The man was spitting blood now, but didn't stop trying to push Aran away and grab for Istve. Something slammed into the back of Aran's head. His grip loosened, his vision momentarily blurring as a woman leaned over him, a grim smile on her face, a metal baton in her hand. There was a hissing sound, too, like a dozen tea kettles steaming at once. And for a moment he thought the blow had affected his hearing, 
And then he blinked up in time to see Ani boiling across the floor. Eye pouches puffed out, whole body turned a furious orange and electric green. She swarmed up the leg of the woman who'd hit him, barely slowing as she moved from the horizontal to the vertical, and then she was horizontal again as the woman went down, foaming from the mouth, her body stiff and welts like green warning signs flecked up her skin where Ani's tentacle spikes had made contact. Ani launched herself from the woman's convulsing body as she fell, spreading her skin flaps to sail across the corridor and land on the face of a man who was in the process of bringing up a pistol to point at Iran. The man sputtered, gave a choked scream, and died, his muscles jerking even in death. The man Aran had been fighting twisted to watch, his own fight forgotten, his face an almost comic picture of horror, or it would have been comic if the situation hadn't been so thoroughly horrific. And then Ani had landed on his back, and his face tightened in a rictus grin, his hands loosening from Aran's throat as his body began to spasm. Ani! Come here, Ani, it's... Aran began frantically. From the corner of his eye, he saw a man yank out a pistol, leveling it at Ani and Aran as he backed down the corridor. Ani must have seen it too, because she ducked under Aran's outstretched hand and slithered towards the man, tentacles pulling her along in a snake-like motion that was deceptively quick. Ani! shouted Aran, but it was no use. She wasn't going to listen to him when she was wound up like this, Emmerich stood halfway down the corridor, and there was calculation on his face under the shock. As Aran watched, he reached out, pressing the airlock control. The inner door hissed open, just in time for the man with the pistol to back into it, apparently hardly noticing where he was going, his full attention focused on the hissing Ani slithering towards him. Aran realized what Emmerich intended a split second later. He scrambled to his feet, heart stuttering with horror, as Emmerich hit the button again, sealing Ani and her victim inside. He sprinted down the corridor. No, Emmerich, please, just... It was too late. Emmerich hit the control, and Aran could hear the pressure in the airlock suck away as the outer door slid open. He threw himself against the door desperately, just in time to see, through the plex porthole, the tip of a tentacle, orange with alarm, grasping at the edge of the door. Ani! he screamed. The tentacle tip slid free and she was gone. There was a hiss as the outer airlock door slid shut behind her. Aran slumped against the inner door, his mind gone blank with despair. Everything around him was strangely foggy. Ani was gone. He couldn't quite make himself believe it was real. Maybe this was a nightmare and he'd wake up to her quiet, chirruping purr as she nudged his face, begging in her unsubtle way for food. When he had the strength in his legs to straighten, he turned wearily. The bodies of the people Ani had killed lay twisted on the ground, their skin a gruesome purplish green where the poison had spread. Someone had grabbed Istve now that the danger was over, and again a pistol had been shoved up against the back of their head. Istve's eyes were wide with shock and pain, and this time Aran didn't try to fight. It would have been useless anyways. Yosip and Inez were being held as well, arms pulled roughly behind their backs. "'Do you want to see someone else you care about die for you?' asked Emmerich, his expression one of mocking sympathy. "'Or are you ready to come nicely?' Aran gave a dull nod. They approached him warily at first, but he didn't struggle, just let them grab his arms and fasten them behind his back with a restraining cord. He didn't struggle as they were shoved along the corridors, and when the door to his cabin was pushed open and he and Istve shoved inside, he didn't try to fight back. They'd pushed Inez and Yosip into the cabin next door, and he'd seen Inez's frantic gaze pleading for him to do something, but he hadn't. The door slid closed, and someone attached an external lock. He glanced quickly over at Istve. They were slumped on the cot, their face bloodless, their eyes closed, as if the effort of staying conscious was all they could muster. They weren't bleeding, at least, and Aran couldn't really bear to look at them anyways. He dropped wearily into his chair and stared at the wall. Ani was gone. Ani was dead. She'd only been trying to save him. It wasn't her fight. She'd been trying to protect him. And when he should have saved her, he hadn't. He'd watched her die. Just like he hadn't been able to save Istve. Just like he hadn't been able to save anyone. To think he'd imagined once that he could be the one to find the cure 
save Istvay and everyone in the system with the defect. He should have damn well known better. But it was too late now. Everything was ruined and Ani was dead and it was his own damn fault. He wasn't sure how long he sat there, staring blankly at the wall. He wasn't sure he cared, honestly. He thought he heard, for a moment, the distant sound of Alba's voice through the amplifiers outside. But before he could catch what she was saying, it cut off. Whatever she'd tried to do, it hadn't made a difference. If he hadn't just imagined it in the first place. At some point, the noise of the ship's engines shifted slightly, their whine taking on a deeper note, and the ship shook a little, like air turbulence in an inatmospheric transport. Aran glanced up dully in time to see, through the plex of the small porthole window, a swirling wall of energy. Istve had glanced up as well, their face taking on an expression of slight interest. And then the sky outside the porthole settled, looking once again like it always had, an endless expanse of nothing, with stars glowing and burning through it. "'We're through the portal,' said Istve, trying for a smile, "'farther than anyone in the system has ever gone.' Aran didn't have the heart to smile back, just turned and dropped his chin in his hands, staring at the blank wall in front of him. So, said Istve at last, quietly, what are we going to do now? For a moment, Aran sat in utter disbelief. Then he turned abruptly to face them. We're not going to do anything, he said harshly. We're going to damn well sit here and not do a single thing, because every single damn time I try to make things better, it makes it worse. I can't fix this, Istve. I can't fix anything. Istve stared at him. Aran, what are you talking about? You're bloody brilliant. You're a damn legend. You've gotten both of us out of scrapes worse than this a hundred times before. Aran stood, knocking his chair backwards. Don't be stupid, he snapped. His voice was shaking, a mixture of anger and self-loathing. You're my friend, I know, I get it. And yes, I can do crap like pulling us out of a volcano after I got us into trouble in the first place, but anything else? Anything real? Any problem I didn't create myself? I can't solve those. I let you get poisoned, Istve. I let Ani... His voice choked for a moment, but he forced himself to keep going. When I was a kid out on the streets, running scared from my foster parents, I couldn't stop them from hurting me. But you found me. And your mom helped. You never asked for a damn thing in return, neither of you. And when she got sick, I didn't even know until she was so far gone that... He swallowed hard, turning away for a moment. If... if I'd been in time, maybe I could have thought of something. Maybe I could have done... something. But I didn't. She died, and I couldn't do a damn thing. And you should have hated me, kicked me out, and left me on my own. But you didn't. And now you're sick, and I can't bloody well save you either. Just almost get you killed, like... Like I got Ani killed. Istve was staring at him, eyes wide with surprise, and Aran couldn't bear to meet their familiar gaze. He turned away in disgust, dropping back into his chair. Aran, said Istve at last. Don't try to make me feel better, Pishti, he said dully, without turning. Nothing you can say will change it. There was another long pause. At last, Istve said, Aran, I've known you since we were both about five, so I'm not going to bother telling you that the genetic defect isn't your fault. You already know that. You just don't care. And I'm not going to bother reminding you that you were ten when my mother died and the entire system had been searching for a cure for the defect for five centuries. I'm not going to say anything about the fact that you couldn't possibly have stopped Ani from doing what she did just now once she saw you were in danger. Hell, maybe you're right. Maybe despite the fact that you've done things our classmates didn't even dare dream of, you're really a complete failure deep down. Maybe everything is your fault. Maybe you're not nearly as good as everyone thinks. Maybe you've just been faking it this whole time. The cot creaked slightly as they stood. But damn it, Aran, there are people on this ship who are going to die. So for hell's sake, fake it a little longer. Because even if you won't believe me that you're the best person on this damn ship... They don't have any better options right now. Aran turned, caught off guard. Istve was supporting themselves on the desk with one hand, their face still drawn and bloodless, and Aran sat blinking at them for a few moments. Istve was wrong. 
He couldn't do this. After everything that had happened, everything he'd already failed at, after watching Ani die, he couldn't make himself stand up and start figuring a way out of the cabin, going to rescue Josip and Inez and maybe even that Chief Justice who Istve hated so much. I... he began. And then he noticed the way Istve was looking at him, that stupid blind faith. He remembered the pleading in Inez's last desperate glance. And he couldn't bring himself to finish the sentence. He couldn't let Istve down, not again, not without at least trying. He took a deep breath and pushed himself to his feet. All right, Pishti, he said, trying to smile. I guess we see if we can fix this, even if... He broke off. Istve was still watching him. Aran, they said quietly. I'm sorry about Ani. I can't tell you how sorry I am. I know how much she meant to you, but she died fighting to save people she cared about, and I know you. No matter what happens, you're not going to do anything less. Their voice choked a little. With an effort, they grinned. All right, then. Now that's settled. What are we going to do? And despite the drawn look on Istve's face and the desperateness of the situation, the sight of their grin was unaccountably reassuring. Aran took a deep breath, pushing back the heavy knot of grief, and went through a quick mental inventory of the supplies in his belt pouch, which Emmerich apparently hadn't thought to confiscate before he'd shoved them in here. Well, he began after a moment, I suppose I could... The ship shook, hard enough to send both him and Istve to the ground. They stared at each other for a moment. What the hell? Aaron began. The ship shuddered again, and in the distance he could hear the sharp shrill of alarms. He scrambled upright and crossed to the small porthole window, peering out at the blackness beyond. Istve joined him a moment later, still unsteady on their feet. The two of them stared at the black of space beyond the plex window for a long moment without speaking. Something cold had wound itself around Aran's chest and squeezed. The gash in the fabric of space, the portal that had been their destination for this entire trip and that now marked their only chance of return to their old life, was sealing shut behind them. Energy sparked and crackled from it like it was alive, and as Aran watched, it let off another snap of whirling energy, and the ship rocked again. What? He began again, panic almost choking the words in his throat, and then there was a final burst of energy so bright Aran staggered back, shielding his face with his arm. He blinked, momentarily blinded and squinted through the white sunburst seared across his vision. The portal was closed. And then the burst of energy hit and the ship rocked and bucked as if it were a desperate animal trying to throw off a predator with jaws latched around the back of its neck. Aran and Istve went sprawling a second time as more alarms howled to life, joining the chorus. Aran lay dazed for a moment, his head aching where it had hit the corner of the desk, then blinked and pushed himself into a sitting position. Istve had already picked themselves up and was scrolling desperately through pages of information on their palm screen. They looked up at Iran, their face suddenly very, very grave. The ship's breaking up, they said quietly. The life support systems are on red line and the hull is cracked in half a dozen places. The ship has a self-sealing system to isolate the breaches, but with this level of damage that will only prolong the inevitable. We have to get off now or we die. The ship lurched again and the cabin door swung free, sliding loosely on its hinges as the ship rocked. Aran caught a glimpse of the door's external lock, broken and useless after the power surge. Well, Istve said at last, pulling themselves to their feet, I guess that solves the problem of the door. Aran gave a grim nod. Come on, he said, let's go.